Welcome to Reverse Engineering News. I'm your host, Hash. Thanks for joining. This week, we're going to talk about an LMR, which is Land Mobile Radio Reverse Engineering Project, and all the vulnerabilities that they found, an AMD processor vulnerability, and the interesting reverse engineering technique that was used to find it, and finally, a few words about Kevin Mitnick, who passed away last week. Now, this LMR reverse engineering project, it's called Tetraburst. It's what they dubbed the vulnerabilities that they found. And I think there's some really good things about this and one that's honestly like horrible. Now there's a Wired article that covers this whole thing. The Wired article is great. There's also a Tetraburst site that they have that shows a couple videos outlining the, the various attacks, kind of showing you that they actually work and some explanation of the vulnerabilities and what they found. But the Wired article really gives you the full context. The summary is uh, they discovered that the keys that are used are very weak. In the best case scenario, they're 80-bit keys. In the worst case, in some weakened algorithms they found, they're even much less than that, which is laughable kind of key size in this day and age. They also found that man-in-the-middle attacks can be performed, which means that uh, you know messages that can be sent, kind of like text messages between these radios, uh, you can send your own messages and spoof them. You can decrypt messages. Um, you can actually ask the radios for the keys and they'll provide it to you if you spoof that you're like a, a base station. Uh, you can record and decrypt encrypted communications. You can actually send your own back. I mean, the whole thing is just like completely owned to put it as, as mildly as possible. Now, the way that they were actually able to get hold of the information they needed was by purchasing a Motorola MTM 5400 radio and then reverse engineering it to dump out these encryption algorithms and the source code that they needed. This stuff is all kept completely secret. You have to sign NDAs as manufacturers to, to even get this code. And so, uh, you know, what's the history of secret encryption algorithms? I'll give you a moment to go look it up. Yeah, they suck. That's what, the, that's what the history is of them. There's always flaws. The reason that all the internet uses open source security uh, algorithms and protocols is because you have to be analyzing this stuff all the time and have eyes on it all the time. The reality is this thing's been around like 20 years and there was a ton of flaws that these guys found in it because apparently none of the manufacturers that were actually putting this code in their radios were even looking at it or trying to find flaws. And so the result is all of the customers buying these systems were buying flawed systems that could be exploited by anyone that took the time to find this stuff and use it for whatever nefarious purposes. Uh, perhaps like the NSA and the GCHQ in the UK. If you look at the Snowden dumps, Apparently, they were sniffing up Tetra data and storing it and saving it in, in different areas. And my guess is decrypting it because they likely had that capability 10 or more years ago. In Malaysia and Argentina, there's mention of it in the Snowden leaks that they were sniffing up uh, Tetra data. And that data isn't very large. Like this is just like, you know, voice data that's encoded and then encrypted. You could sniff that stuff up just constantly and save it until you figure something out. Uh, my guess is that this isn't the first time these vulnerabilities were found and likely these uh, government agencies were able to just get this source code. Now the time that these manufacturers wanted was who knows how long. It took a year and a half to get to this point from after they had found it and everything to negotiate even releasing to the public that these vulnerabilities were found. That's a long time. On August 9th, more information will be released, their own paper, and they'll be given talks at Black Hat and DEF CON. Uh, I'll be at DEF CON, so I'm really looking forward to hearing this talk. And I'm curious to find out from them if the Motorola radio they selected was the first radio they tried, or if it was just the easiest one or the one that they were able to actually extract the data from. I'm curious why they chose that radio over all the different ones that, that exist in the market. Now, the part that's disappointing is generally when you find flaws, you release proof of concept code. You release a way for other people to test it. Like say you and I have a Tetra system in place and we're sending our secure critical infrastructure data across it. 
How do we know if we're vulnerable or not? How do we test this? Well, it'd be nice just download some proof of concept code and run it. See with a software defined radio, is our system vulnerable or not? They're not releasing this proof of concept code. They say, and I quote, uh, because of the potential for abuse. Uh, I say that's ridiculous. And the bigger issue is that these systems, they won't get patched, they won't get repaired, they won't get upgraded until they have to. When you release a proof of concept into the wild, you force the hand of companies, individuals, anyone. They have to address it. Now, I could rant about that forever. So let's move on to the Zenbleed AMD processor vulnerability that was found. It was found by Travis at Google's information security team, and it basically affects AMD processors of the Zen 2 class. That happens to be the one that's in my computer right over there. So I went to my motherboard manufacturer's website and downloaded a BIOS update, which for sure was right there, even though it's only been released uh, less than a couple months ago. Uh, everybody seems to have addressed this and provide an update. Hey, and surprise, surprise, Travis has a proof of concept on his blog that we can go and, and show that this thing works. And it's a hell of a vulnerability. Basically, in these AMD processors, uh, anyone can access the registered data. That's like a VM that you think is containerized somewhere, some other container. This kind of these registers that are all used by the processor can be accessed by any of these things, essentially allowing them to kind of escape the containerization that they're currently in. Basically, there's a register addressing table, and that's pointing to places in memory where these various registers are being stored kind of temporarily. It's like a it's like a table of pointers, essentially, to uh, memory locations. And there's something called a zero bit. And so if you want to clear a register, you set this zero bit and that clears the register data. But the reality is it doesn't actually clear the register data. It just sets the zero bit. And because of speculative execution, sometimes you have to roll back some code that was executed. You have to put something back. What Travis found is that it's possible even after a register was cleared by some other part of the code, to get it to roll that back and see what was in the register. Now, things like your passwords or any other kind of data that are flowing through the system can be available in those registers. Now, in order to find this, Travis created a new method of fuzzing, basically. So fuzzing is the, uh, it's the art of attacking something. Say we're fuzzing a piece of software. Say we're fuzzing an input field and it's asking for our name. We might just try sending all kinds of random characters and different links at this program just over and over and over hundreds of thousands of times to see if this program ever crashes or experiences an issue. And if it crashes, we know, hey, there was something interesting about that data we sent. What was the data that was sent when the program crashed? What Travis did is basically come up with a way to remove the effects of the speculative execution. So he would write two programs that are essentially exactly the same. They should produce the same results. But in one, he would add in additional commands, additional instructions that might clear out something or cause something to flush or a no-op or something like that that just does nothing. But in the end, the main body of the code you know, adding a few numbers together, subtracting something, multiplying, the result should be the same, even clearing these additional buffers or other things in memory. And what he found is that it wasn't the same in certain cases. And that's how he was able to discover uh, this flaw. It's a very interesting read on his blog of how he came up with this idea. Uh, and I'm sure it would be an interesting concept uh, for us to use against some other targets. Now, finally, I wanted to say a few words about Kevin Mitnick. Um, although it's mostly he was known in the, the hacking culture and this channel's about reverse engineering, I think they're very tightly intertwined. I mean, a lot of reverse engineering is done in an effort to aid hacking and, and back and forth. It all, it all kind of goes hand in hand. And the qualities of Kevin, his curiosity, uh, his desire to figure things out, to find hard challenges, all of these things, I think are, they're characteristics that we all have. 
Uh, if you read his book, The Ghost in the Wires, I mean, you really get a sense for how far he would take things and what his level of curiosity was. It reminded me of a quote as I read that book uh, that's, that's most people tiptoe through life, hoping they make it safely to death. I always think of that quote, uh, any, anything I'm thinking about doing in my life or decisions I'm making. Uh, and I think if you read that book, The Ghosts and the Wires, you'll see Kevin definitely did not tiptoe through life. And he had experiences and did things that literally most people only ever read about. Uh, and so I would highly suggest uh, reading that book and, and seeing uh, all of the things that, that he managed to do and, and how he turned that into good things later in his life and, and helped a lot of other people realize the, the flaws that existed in their processes and systems. Now, as always, you can find me on Twitter at BitBangingBytes. On Discord, there's a link down in the description. We're all over there chatting about reverse engineering and, and various projects that people are working on. You should join the reverse engineering wiki, if you haven't already, and contribute things you're working on so that we can all learn and grow uh, and ultimately advance the state of security. It doesn't advance on its own. It advances because we push it forward unwillingly. That's why it advances. So thanks for watching. Go hack something.